Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to another edition of Muslim Skeptic Live. This is Brother Daniel Hayraju. I'm here with Kareem Sarajuddin. Brother Kareem, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Yeah, our pleasure. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with Brother Kareem, mashallah, he is a very well experienced um, uh, can we say therapist or should we say life coach or should we say counselor? I, I think human scientist is the best uh, capture of it all. Okay, mashallah. So um, you are the founder of Noor Human Consulting and uh, the Coffee with Kareem podcast, both of which we'll discuss uh, and get your insights on. You have a BA in psychology and comparative religion from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, mm -hmm. mashallah. Boston brethren here. Uh, good and times, then, good times. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, MA, Masters in East-West Psychology and Spiritual Counseling from the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. So, mashallah. And then also uh, Strategic Interventionist and Coach at Purify Your Gaze, uh, which we can also discuss your work with them. And you have 15 years of educational instruction in secondary schools, universities, and on the ground with workshops and seminars. And you've had over the years, over a thousand clients, uh, people you have uh, consulted and helped, mashallah. So very happy to have you here. Uh, Pleasure. So uh, Brother Kareem, uh, I'm going to be asking you some questions. And inshallah, we'll also have some uh, questions from the audience. If something comes up in the live chat, I'll ask as well. Uh, maybe you can start off by telling us more about Noor Human Consulting and what is it exactly you do? And also, what is your long-term vision with that? And what are you really trying to accomplish? Yeah, thanks for the uh, question. So Noor um, Human Consulting is essentially a place where um, Muslims in the West specifically, but I mean every, you know, anybody can come um, and get spiritual counseling, uh, key concepts and education uh, and personal development coaching, counseling, consulting services that's going to help you accomplish your goals for this life and the next. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we don't consider the akhirah in our personal pursuits or, you know, we just fixate on, I want to get a job, I want to get married, I want to get, you know, into this college. And Noor's, you know, paradigm, the word Noor, as we know, it means light, vision, illumination, but more importantly, spiritual, right? And we know that in the physical sense, you can't see anything if the lights are out. You know, there's no vision. Vision doesn't come out of your eyes. It's something that is, uh, it comes from a different source and it reflects on objects which then hits your eyes and then you can see. So in that sense, what are we not seeing if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nur is not being reflected in ourselves or in reality, right? And so there is this notion in the Quranic worldview and uh, that we are meant to see and have vision and a type of illumination that goes beyond just physical light. But physical light also gives us a very powerful a parable that when the lights are out, you can't see anything, you can't move, you can't do anything, right? There's no point of you having a direction or a purpose. If you're in a pitch black, you know, basement, you can't get out, right? So what about a spiritual light that's lacking? So that was kind of my, you know, dream or um, one of the things that I really, you know, it captured me when I was younger. And so this is why I call it Nude Human Consulting. And right now, alhamdulillah, myself, uh, as well as three other sisters, are on the team and we provide different specialties um, whether it's women's work or you know premarital marital spiritual counseling uh, these are all some of the um, uh, focuses that we have at Noor and inshallah over time I hope to grow uh, it to be this kind of online incubator like one-stop shop where we'll also have inshallah Muslim psychiatrists and you know maybe clinical therapists or other types of helpers people that specialize let's say in ruqya or dealing with you know supernatural matters that tend can come up with some people's experiences so kind of a place where you have human and spiritual science professionals um, together and offering different services for our community that's my vision for mood may Allah inshallah uh, give it success I mean I mean 
So you're saying the spiritual sciences, uh, you're talking about uh, certain things that dovetail with psychology. So what are really the sources that you're using in terms of understanding these kinds of complex issues on the spiritual side, uh, on the Islamic side, and then how do you gel that? Or how, do, how is that compatible with what might be considered more secular sciences? Yeah. Well, you know, for me, I... Uh when I, you know, getting degrees in psychology, you know, was, was very helpful and useful. But when I started to kind of try to work with Muslims, um, I just realized, you know, that some of the stuff just isn't going to work for, uh, for us, you know, like the paradigm, the definition of the human condition, uh, it doesn't quite apply in, a, in some ways to the Quranic worldview. So, like, aside from, you know, heart, you know, neuroscience or understanding biochemistry in the human being, that, you know, doesn't always have, uh, you know, a need for a religious lens, per se, to discover those things, right? Because you're essentially understanding, um, you know, the uh, properties of, of the physical body. But, you know, take a, a, you know, but even so, how you're going to treat or help somebody, let's say, with depression or anxiety, um, you may use something like cognitive behavioral therapy in Western psychology, which is great, uh, but it's also something that is very Islamic, you know, in that what we think to ourselves, what we say to ourselves, what we believe, what we repeat to ourselves, you know, what kind of athkar do we have? Because we all have athkar, dhikr, by the way. Some of it is very negative and rooted in, you know, no substance uh, based on our, the Quranic worldview, and some of it is. So, the person also brings in, I want to say, this extra layer of one's existence, this dimension of spirituality, of akhirah, that there is a divine relationship that actually directly impacts every atom in the universe and every heart and mind and soul in existence. That is basically what, you know, in my estimation, Islamic psychology has to offer. And ilm and nafs is an established science in the Islamic tradition. Um, we have uh, classical texts. Uh, that have been writing on things like this for uh, several centuries. I mean, Muslims, for example, you have, uh, for example, al Bayhaqi, al Balkhi, al Ghazali. You know, there's different uh, scholars of the past who already were addressing trauma therapy, overcoming anxiety, CBT, depression, uh, P PTSD. These are things that are actually, subhanAllah, documented uh, in the Islamic tradition. Now, am I accessing those classical texts myself? No. But I'm, you know, reading translations. Um, obviously, the Quran itself has a lot of uh, direction around understanding the nature of the human being. What is harmful? What is um, uh, beneficial? What helps you grow and become more empowered and excellent in your nature? And what doesn't? So clearly, if we accept that Allah exists, the Quran is a uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then naturally, there's going to be some very important guiding uh, uh, principles about what the human being is and what they ought to be uh, based on that uh, map coming from from the uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one of the things I kind of recognize as a person and personally and professionally that if we're really going to help people and whether you're Muslim or not um, and we recognize that the Creator has uh, specific uh, guiding principles about what it means to be a successful human being, then that should probably be involved and considered uh, in our approach to helping uh, humanity and certainly members of our own community that consider themselves consciously pursuing uh, the truth and beauty and goodness based on Allah and His Messenger. MashaAllah, um, that's very profound. The one thing that I think um, would be interesting to get your insight on is how much space is there within secular psychology and cognitive behavioral studies? How much room is there that accommodates or can, can accommodate these kinds of positions that you're expressing and that I think all Muslims share? And, but uh, is there any area of conflict? Um, is, is there capacity for these ideas? And if so, are there any areas of conflict? Yeah, that's a great question. So, look, when it comes to like a therapist and their relationship to a patient or a client, right, it all depends on the therapist and the client. So there are, for example, um, people that aren't religious 
but they're able to hold, you know, very accommodating space for people to bring in their religious or spiritual beliefs. Or if a client says to their therapist, look, I want to do dhikr in our sessions from now on, and the therapist is going to be like, okay, sure, like, let's, you know, hold space for that, and, you know, why is this important to you, and what do you want to say, and do you want to do it for five minutes? And so, of course, there are people that are going to accommodate the client's needs, because that's the first etiquette of uh, clinical therapy, is that you help the patient with their uh, established goals, right, whatever it is. So... In that sense, there is, of course, sometimes room and accommodation, given, again, the therapist's multicultural sensitivity or religious sensitivity, if any. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have to recognize that any subject you go study, whether it's philosophy or biology or, you know, uh, psychology, there is always a dominant ideology, right? There, there is always a, um, you know, you start from kind of the ancients and, and trying to move your way into the modern. I mean, that's what you do when you study science, when you study philosophy, you go to Aristotle, right? Even, and then you work your way up. So you have to kind of get a sense and encapsulate the tradition as it's evolved so that you can now build on it and recognize that there's a lot of things you don't need to figure out from scratch, right? So with that said, Western psychology was born, you know, I mean, it's not that old, right? We're talking, you know, um, 200 years, you know, tops. If you want to include, you know, ideas of the Renaissance and Enlightenment or ancient Greek thinking, okay, sure. But um, it's a very new science in that sense. It is more Western-centric and Eurocentric than uh, anything else when you study uh, psychology in the West, right? Like most subjects, naturally. Uh, and so that was one of the reasons why I did my master's in something called East-West Psychology, because it was literally addressing that issue and saying, look, there is 90, you know, there's a whole other part of the planet here that has sciences and traditions on understanding the nature of the human being, psychology, consciousness, and so on and so forth. So naturally, there will be a tension uh, with certain ideas or constructs or beliefs. And sometimes, like any institution or private organization that kind of, you know, overlooks whether, you know, this type of uh, field, and, you know, for example, the American Psychological Association and Psychiatric Association, these are private institutions that overlook what's considered legit psychology, psychiatry, or clinical therapy. So while we need, of course, systems like this to make sure that, you know, things are safe, you know, people are getting training, there's practice, of course, we have to have protocols and these types of things, but of course, there's always going to be times where a person may experience a type of moral tension. So for instance, if I am a very conscious practicing Muslim, um, and I am a licensed therapist, um, that empowers me in a lot of ways, but in some ways it could also limit my ability to um, help somebody or to be honest with myself. Right. So, for instance, a person may be told, you know, part of your training or practicum is you need to work with these clients or these cases. And these cases may represent something that is morally opposed to the conscious Muslims uh, worldview. Now, you can say, look, I'm just going to help them as a human being. I'm going to put that kind of stuff aside. But what hap happens then when you hit that bridge where the person now says, I want you to give me counseling on how to enhance my sexuality? right in a way that is morally opposed to the therapist's worldview so this is just an example of how moral tension can occur um, even though you may you know just want to help a human being for being human but at some point we have to ex recognize that every facet of a person's life and experience is on the table when you're trying to help the human being as a whole right so you are gonna have to face or address these issues um, whether you like it or not especially you know, now that we have a lot more uh, sensitivity and uh, exploration around um, ideas and ways of being human that um, you would, I could say, wasn't as a common or accessible as the last 10, 20 years. Well, if, maybe if I can just push you a little bit on the point that you're making. Um, so if someone is saying that, you know, I want to enhance my sexuality and you have to, if you're operating under these secular guidelines as you mentioned you have to hold space and you have to maybe not bring in your moral positions based on islam oh so, no you definitely can't bring you in your can't moral right positions. yeah of course not um because 
you're not there to bring your moral position. You're there to help the client and patient with whatever goals they have. Right? Even if they're self-destructive goals. Well, I, again, you're, as a clinical therapist, you're not supposed to have a moral judgment or a place to say what is good or not good. Your job is just to help the human being find um, confidence and fulfillment in their goals and to direct them to understand their own truth. That's, you know, I'd say a, a simple way of putting it, although I don't want to oversimplify it, but, you know, that's the general notion that I understand at least. Yeah, that's the notion that they're promoting, but this is different from what your project is, if I'm understanding correctly. Yeah, nude human consulting, you know, is not a clinical practice. It's not a, you know, uh, it's not a therapeutic practice in that sense. You know, our work is more spiritual counseling. So we counsel people, mentor people using a paradigm that is rooted in a spiritual or religious worldview. In this case, it's Islam, although I've worked with Christians and Jews before, by the way because there's so much common ground there. And sometimes that's all they're looking for. They're just like, I want somebody who believes in God, for God's sake, you know, because <laughs> it's hard sometimes for people to get that sense, right? So, um, but yeah, so that's, you know, that's why I also do nude is because, first of all, clinical therapists are not the only people that can heal and help people, all right? Mm -hmm. The Prophet Sallallahu wasn't a, a doctor, he wasn't a clinical therapist, and he healed and counseled and transformed the planet in a very short period of time and until today sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's bringing lives and hearts back to life so we have to recognize you know that healing growing and optimization doesn't always is not always just what is conventionally uh, standardized or out there another simple case of this is i forget what what the country was but one of my colleagues who's a psychiatrist in the uk he mentioned that it was a country in africa and they had gone through a lot of uh, traumatic events with some of the issues going on there. And, and I forget the nation, but the bottom line is they didn't have enough psychiatrists and therapists to come and help people with PTSD. So you know what they did? They trained like, you know, 50 aunts and moms of the village. Mm. And they actually, based on the research, showed and demonstrated that these mothers and aunts have made more impact in healing on people's recovery from PTSD than if you had another 10 therapists and psychiatrists coming, right? Because of course there's a cultural personalized bond and intimacy that's there versus just bringing somebody from the outside and applying some like model right on you. So it's just another way of, of demonstrating that there are multiple ways of knowing, multiple ways of healing, experiencing and getting guidance and support. And it doesn't always have to fall under one specific category or another, just like I would say, you know, we don't go to the imam for every problem we have. That's one of the issues, right? We don't go to the imam with every single issue that we have. Some things are not going to um, uh, be uh, in his or her lane, right? Some things you have to go to uh, a person who has more expertise, right? Well, so similarly, <laughs> we diversify, inshallah, in, sure. in how we serve and heal. And I think our community has unique, um, some unique journeys that uh, you're not going to find anywhere else. And that requires more unique and custom services uh, that incorporate cultural sensitivity, you know, his heritage, uh, different types of Islamic approaches. So, you know, I'll stop there and uh, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, uh, so can you tell me what is really the most common issue that Muslims are coming uh, to you for your services? Uh, I'd say um, the majority of cases that I've worked with personally, it mostly has to do with uh, relationships, um, you know, uh, marriage, uh, skills, how to improve marriage, how to, you know, deal with uh, getting, you know, adjusting to marriage, um, because a lot of people, they don't have a, a good training ground for marriage. So I always tell people, look, first two years of your marriage usually is also the training ground for your marriage, which is why it can seem very scary or you can mess things up. Mm -hmm. but you know, I always, you know, the, the sooner the better is, is always uh, a good rule and pre, uh, prerequisites, of course, as well, right, is very important. And take your time to get to know each other. Um, doesn't mean you spend five years, but also don't get married after the hour that you speak to them necessarily, right? And again, I'm talking about people in the United States as the context here, right? Some places that works just fine. But um, from my experience, most of the reasons why people have marital issues is because they had a superficial approach to marriage. 
They had unrealistic expectations or they did not have any realistic knowledge or skills about what it entails to be in a dedicated, committed relationship and build a family. Most of us just look at it as, this is my freedom, this is my halal sex, this is the way I can get more money, and we forget that, you know, for those of us that are married and parents, there is so many layers to the family experience than just those limited items. So where uh, could a Muslim who is wanting to get married get that information that you're describing to prepare them for expectations or disabuse them of these kinds of superficial ideas about what uh, their expectations should be and what they are actually going to get in a marriage? Yeah. Other than halal um, sex. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of uh, good, great online resources. Um, I know that. Uh, um, I mean, I have a few podcasts where I talk about it, nothing like too serious. I have a couple of courses that I've developed for my clients, um, which are also available for everybody um, at nudeacademy.com, uh, but I'm just starting that. So that's a place where I'm going to be trying to put together some of these key concepts and knowledge for people. Uh, I remember there's also a website called, I believe, Nikah 101, which is a really cool project that some brothers are doing where they're consolidating everything that's out there from uh, our scholars and imams that has to do with anything that has to do with marriage and pre-marriage in one place. So I think it's Nikah 101. Um, definitely, that's a great resource and it's a, it just puts it all together. Instead of you looking all over the internet and YouTube, um, they did that for, for you. So they put it all in one place. So that would be a great place to check out because you also have you know diverse voices and, and tips. Okay. Uh, let's go to a couple of questions from the uh, viewers. Um, one question from Jinan is, uh, PD PTSD was described and addressed in classical books. Uh, I think you mentioned that. Could you elaborate Correct. on that? Correct. Yes. Okay. So, for example, um, as we know, uh, there were, you know, wars and battles that were happening right in the Middle East you had of course um, you know uh, the Mongol invasion that came and other uh, skirmishes and so on and so forth so the point is that there this was identified um, this notion of post-traumatic stress disorder that when you experience a very shocking and unsettling event that now breaks or ruptures your notion of routine predictability and what is safe in your environment these are things that the early Muslims had already identified very clearly, as well as um, you know uh, how to overcome anxiety and stress through CBT. In fact, um, one book worth checking out, Malik Bedri is one of the authors. He's also one of the founders of the um, International Association of Islamic Psychology. Um, you can check out their website, and they also have uh, literature as well as um, efforts to revive the classical tradition and texts that do exist. Sure. Okay, and another question is when it comes to people who are coming for uh, your services, what's the ratio between men and women? I would say, um, I mean, overall, the majority have been females. Um, but I'd say in the last two years, um, it's been almost even, 50-50. Uh, and I would, I think that that's because since I launched my podcast, perhaps, you know, a lot more males kind of were drawn to that um, pro uh, process of, hey, maybe I can get counseling or, you know, start doing this stuff. Because generally speaking, I find that females are the relationship keepers of the family. They tend to be a lot more wise in social and emotional um, needs and so they tend to be the ones that pursue the healing and um, you know growth of the family and the relationship uh, so alhamdulillah you know that's been the stats from from what I could say off the top of my head all right um, you mentioned um, your podcast coffee with cream so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that how has this been going because uh, it's been is it almost two years now yeah, this Ram Ramadan, inshallah, will be my third uh, Ramadan anniversary because I launched it in, in Ramadan 2017. And what was your intention behind, you know, running this well, podcast? Well, yeah, number one, I, uh, a lot of people, you know, recommended I, I do something like that because I'm not very um, active in media generally, like never really, you know, pushed YouTube or these types of things. So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, this is this would be a nice way to 
maybe have a little more media, um, and it's a space I'm very comfortable with. You know, I, I know how to produce audio and uh, different things. So my intention was really to show the world and the Muslim community that we have um, amazing people in our community doing wonderful things, right? Because as someone who grew up in the United States, as someone who got, you know, went through the, the turbulence of post 9-11 and, and so on, um, I felt like we need to, we need, we need, the Muslim community needs a better brand, <laughs> right? Like we've been getting, you know, really bad uh, branding for a while. So I thought this would be a great way to harness the network I've built over the years. Uh, and bring people that are doing lovely and amazing things and also people who are you know intellectually and spiritually stimulating um, you know uh, our discussions and addressing challenges and you know we are we really have to work together as a community if we're going to succeed so this was kind of a way where I hope to consolidate you know my own learning lessons giving advice as well as bring in other experts to share their gifts to the world Right, yeah, I've been a long-time listener of you know the podcast. I've had the pleasure of being on it a few times now. So, Jazakallah sure. Khairah for that uh, service that you're doing, mashallah. Uh, here's a question that um, I wanted to ask you and really discuss with you. Um, within psychology, from what I can tell as a non-expert, um, and counseling and therapy, from a secular side, there is, seems to be a very high premium placed on not being judgmental and being very validating of people's desires and what they want for themselves. I think you put in terms of holding space. So this seems to be something that is coming into the Muslim community. It's being pushed into the Muslim community from different avenues. And there is a sense that we need to destigmatize certain things that are religiously stigmatized, whether it's some related to sexuality, uh, suicide is something that recently has come under the microscope, Most, the Muslim community and Islam's position on suicide, things of this nature, uh, pornography. So what do you think, what do you make of this trend? Where is it something new within psychology itself or has it always been like this? And what would you, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on how Muslims should respond to this? Yeah. Well, first of all, I feel like at least from my, you know, short years on this planet, I've definitely noticed, uh, uh, you know, things, m morality or what's right and wrong as far as the public sphere or the scientific academic world, um, certainly those boundaries have changed. Uh, and in some ways, there may not even be a line anymore, right? But I feel like, look, there's a difference between, you know, what you just said, which is kind of like the, you know, validate, do your thing, no judgment, it's your life, nobody has the right to tell you anything. Essentially, you're your own lord, right? That's one extreme. But I also feel that, you know, a common pattern in the Muslim community is the other extreme, which is, yes, certain things are haram, but if we go to such an extent where we say we don't even want to talk about it or address it or acknowledge that it's happening, this is another danger. And, I'll get, and I like to see it more as, let's use the word allowance. And allowance in the sense of we have to allow each other to be human and make mistakes and recognize some of us are going to do some pretty anti-Islamic or un-Islamic things in our life, right? And we need to, um, there's a difference between saying, you know, and that's the extreme reaction, by the way. That's why you have this kind of leftist um, pursuit of, because they're responding to the other extreme, Danny, right? Which is nobody ever talks about anything. Right. Um, and so on. And so now it's like we have to talk about everything and everything is great. So I'll give you a simple case from the Sunnah so that I, I love. The Prophet said, so a man came to him and who loved Zina. Right. He said, oh, Messenger of Allah, make Zina halal for me. Like, I, this is something I want to do. I like it. The Prophet so said, you know, some people today, they would do the, the, that right extreme, which is get out of here. Who do you think you are? I'm the messenger of Allah. This is the masjid. You come here and ask me for something haram, hasha, you know. Tayyip, okay, we didn't get anywhere. And that's what a lot of people sometimes experience, right? Uh, on the other hand, the Prophet didn't say, you know, good for you and I hope it makes you happy, right? Go do your thing. No, Allah's all mercy. No. 
But he did say this, come closer. So he humanized him. He allowed him to express and share what his desire or struggle was, even though he may not realize it's a struggle or desire. And this is another thing we have to remember is half the people out there may not even know what they're claiming or saying is diametrically opposed to this greater um, uh, worldview that the Quran is, is giving us, right? So the Prophet said, come closer, made him feel safe, and allowed him to express what he said, right? And then he just countered it with humanistic and intellectual propositions. He said, what would you like if everything you wanted to do to these women, this guy did to your sister, right? Or your mom or your aunt, you know, how would you feel about that? He said, I wouldn't like that at all. It's like, okay, so you're asking me to, to say it's halal for you to go do these things to others, right? Mm -hmm. The golden rule principle, don't do to others what you don't want done yourself, right? So that's one of the ways that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually okay. counseled him. So did he allow him to express what he wanted? Did he allow him to say something that was, you know, many people wouldn't have the space to hold mm -hmm. something like that, right? But he did not give him a green light to now go do something haram. In fact, the man came out and said, I love zina more than anything else before I talked to the Rasul Sallallahu and after I, I was disgusted by it more than anything else, right? Which shows us that we do have to check ourselves, right, when it comes to certain things. Now on the notion of suicide, because I know this is a sensitive topic today, look, you know, do I think that every single suicide um, falls right under that category of, you know, they're going to hell and this and that. In fact, I don't really know the hadith uh, about that, to be honest. I've, I've, I've heard this concept, but I've never done the research myself that when you could, you know, commit suicide, it's straight to hell, no questions asked. Um, but again, we know that some rules in Islam, they're generally applied, and there are circumstances where they can't. So for instance, do I really believe that Allah Rahman Rahim is going to send somebody to hell forever if they were beaten and abused for the first, you know, 11 years of their life. Um, they had a biochemical severe imbalance where they produced no positive, you know, moods, uh, right. moods naturally. Is this person the same light as someone who, you know, just had a gripe with God and their life sucked and I'm a victim and they played out this kind of prophecy of I'm just going to kill myself because there's no worth or value. You know, I don't know if that's all the same thing, right? So. I think no, it's I, difficult so, when you have somebody go to a masjid and say, my son committed suicide and we need to bury him and he's had a mental illness all his life, right? And he took went off the medication or we couldn't afford the medication anymore and he lost his mind and, and jumped off the building. A masjid shouldn't turn that family away, for example, in my opinion, right? But I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts because I don't think it's black and white at all. Well, on the issue of going straight to hell uh, i'm not sure where that's from the idea that someone commits suicide and they go straight to hell it's it's considered a it is a major sin right and Allah, we know that allah can that. forgive and allah says that he can forgive any sin other than shirk other than associating partners with him so when it we have you know the prophet i'm mentioning how from past communities there's a man who killed a hundred people right he wow. murdered a hundred people and yet Allah forgave him because he made the intention um, to uh, reform himself. So, you know, things, I, I think the point with, de with stigmatization is that calling it a sin, right? That's what is in question. Um, and there are voices uh, with this kind of, whether it's more academic, more secular, but still on the margins of the Muslim community saying that we need to destigmatize this, meaning not even consider it a sin because on the question of how Allah will judge in the Akhirah, a person, uh, an individual, we don't have knowledge. We can't make a dis, you know, statement either way. We can only judge by what's apparent and say, okay, this is sinful or this act is a sinful act and so forth. But to destigmatize it, I think that's what is at issue. And, and what you were saying earlier about you know, when uh, with the example of the man who went to the Prophet so I'm saying he, he, he loves zina, he wants to commit zina. And I think that's an amazing example uh, from the seerah of the Prophet so But again, the Prophet, as you mentioned, like the balance there, because what you're describing, and I want it to be lost on people listening, is that he maintained the moral stance, right? The, the stigma of zina was, it was throughout his entire answer, right? Uh, if anything, he 
emphasize the stigma and explain why this should be something stigmatized in a way that the person could understand. It wasn't taking away the, the stigma of the act, but I think what you said was very important, the, the approach and that one-on-one -on -one being able to uh, discuss and hear someone, give them space and so forth. I think that's important, but my concern, and maybe you can speak to this, is when that desire for holding space starts to press against, okay, we need to stop stigmatizing these behaviors. We need to stop preaching, right? Uh, the, that zina is wrong, that same-sex behavior is wrong, that suicide is wrong. That's what I'm, I'm concerned about. And uh, do, you, do you think that there is something like this pushing against the Muslim community? Or am I just, you know, is that just my impression? Well, look, I'm not as, uh, I'm definitely not as informed and I would say active as, as yourself, you know, sir, <laughs> when it comes to some of these themes. But have I noticed um, a shift in paradigm and certain beliefs and values from when I was, you know, in college? Absolutely. I mean, there's stuff I, uh, I'm like, what? What are you talking about, right? How are you even quoting the Quran right now and making that claim? But subhanAllah, there's people that really feel that way. So, I mean, this is, I mean, I don't know, again, I don't know a lot about this. I mean, are there, is there now a push now where people want to make suicide okay? Is that, is that what's happening? Or, I mean, is that one of the reasons why you brought that up? Or Yeah, I mean, there, that, are, there are articles that are being published uh, citing different Muslim counselors and academics, multiple, uh, published in mainstream outlets. Like there was an article from BuzzFeed recently that I was reading. Um, I, how reputable BuzzFeed is, not very, but still, it's I would consider it mainstream. And just it was all about how we need to destigmatize suicide in the Muslim community. Mm. And but it's, it's the you know. destigmatization about you know having janazah or funeral services because again, from my experience. People tend to go, oh, if it's a suicide, you know, we don't want anything to do with it. Like, it can't come, we're not doing Janaza, we're not making dua for the person, you can't do your service here. So, is that, I, I mean, if that's the issue, then I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a good point, right? Because, again, not every suicide is somebody who's just, you know, hateful towards God and the gift of life, right? So, is that what those articles are about, or is it literally about, Suicide is a choice, just like eating vanilla ice cream or choosing to marry this person or choosing not to. So, I mean, is that really what is being said? I don't know. I haven't read those articles. But you know, why, would, why I, would people promote uh, suicide as an okay thing versus how to um, deal with a suicide in the community? That's a different discussion, right? I think that they're not making that... Uh, and that, that article certainly doesn't make the nuance uh, that you're making, and they are promoting it as look this is a choice this is a person like if they're going the only reason that someone commits suicide because it 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 goes contrary to a kind of secular liberal thought process that if a person is committing suicide the only reason someone would take their life is because they've been abused they feel extremely traumatized by their life and so they take they took their life they shouldn't be blamed for that so how can you consider it a sin and how can you consider it a major sin right so this is what is the this is the conflict and this is the attitude that people have is that no we don't we shouldn't consider this a major sin like the person is traumatized like they have all this abuse and therefore how can you pile on the issue of the masjid my understanding maybe someone of viewing can correct me if i'm wrong but when a muslim dies whatever the means it's for kifaya that someone is needing to do uh, burial in Janaza. So if one particular masjid is not doing it, there has to be someone who is, is going to do it. Uh, right. That's my understanding of the fiqh um, when it comes to someone who is, you know, even some of these people who might have committed crimes against others and then they're killed in the process. Um, right. Someone has to bury them uh, because they're known as Muslims and so forth. So I, I'm not aware of all the nuances of the FIP, but the the article that I'm referencing and other articles aren't making these nuances. They're saying the stigma, considering this a sin, is contrary to conscience, moral conscience. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, I haven't read those articles, but what I can say about that, and in general, at least my understanding, I'm not an expert in uh, Islamic law or anything like that, but, you know, I, I do try my best to learn um, 
when I can. And one of the things I have learned from my teachers is that uh, rules or um, rules or positions about in Islam, uh, like when it comes to um, the, they generally apply, right? But circumstances or certain situations, there those always exist. I mean, this is very well understood in Islamic law and, and you know the categories of Islamic law. Um, so, for example, you know, make seventy excuses for your brother. That's not quite a law, but it's more of an encouragement. But the point here is that you don't make seventy excuses for your brother who has already backstabbed you twelve times, right? You're just a knucklehead at that point, right? Mm -hmm. you, the rule applies for if you know a person is doing something or not showing up or whatever that's outside of the general pattern of who this person generally is. So you start making excuses for them because you know this is out of the ordinary, right? right. But if seven times in a row they just, you know, uh, left you hanging and ghosted you, then you don't make excuses for them anymore. You move on and you have another relationship with a different person, right? So similarly, suicide from, again, I don't know the fiqh, but what I learned when I was younger was that it is considered a sin. Um, and yes, it is considered a sin, right? Um, and some cases, Allah will under, uh, judge or hold that person accountable in a different light than another person who committed suicide. Again, that's not our terrain. But our terrain is, in my understanding, to live according to the standard and checks and balances that you know is known in the deen um, uh, by the consensus, right? And so that is going to be our standard. Now, uh, so that's my understanding is generally those are the rules. Now, again, I don't know the proofs of suicide being uh, haram or a sin. I mean, I think that it's part of common sense as well, right? Often Islam reflects evergreen truths. Uh, it's very, I mean, a lot of people I know who became Muslim, that's one of the first things they say. They're like, you know, I always believed in God. I always felt these natural, you know, fitra inclinations about things. And then I learned about Islam and it was all there, right? So, I mean, is it a sin? Well, again, what is a sin to anybody anymore? Sins are based on a particular worldview. So if there is no akhira in your worldview, or there is no sense of actual right and wrong beyond subjective interpretation, then it's very easy to just say, look, it's just a statistical probability issue. It's just an existential, you know, matter of roulette. Some people kill themselves, some people do euthanasia, some people, you know, don't. So why do we have to stigmatize it, right? So it all, I think, depends on, on the lens you're coming from. But Daniel, these, uh, you know me, I, I really want to unpack all this. So we're going to have to do a, a round two soon because I uh, have to have actually to go. get going, subhanAllah. Okay, okay. So, yeah, sorry we went to the edge of the time here. So I know that you have limited <laughs> time. Uh, I'm going to continue, inshallah, just uh, with the broadcast. But there's a lot Everyone that you stick just stick around said. for the for the be the second better half, inshallah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have you on again, and we'll have uh, in depth on on these issues because we're just like scratching the surface here. Uh, totally. Yeah. No, I mean, I love I love having dialogue. So definitely, uh, let's let's arrange this. And thank you all for listening. And um, you know, forgive me if I made any mistakes. It's for myself and. Uh, uh, may Allah increase all of us and, and make us sincere in pursuing the truth, goodness, and justice. I mean, yeah. and can you just before you go tell people where to find you um, online? Yeah, yes. Uh, visit coffeewithkareem.com to check out my podcast and everything revolving around that. Nudehuman.com or nudecounseling.com, nude human consulting, they all go to the same place. Um, that's where you can also find uh, services with myself or one of our lovely members, uh, on, uh, one of our providers on the team. Okay, okay, Barakallahu uh, Feekum. Again, appreciate your time, and I'll continue speaking to the audience, but we'll say Assalamu Alaikum to Brother Thank Kareem. You. Thank you so much, Brother. Assalamu Alaikum. We'll see you soon, inshallah. Inshallah. Wa Alaikum Assalamu Okay. So, Ooh. alhamdulillah, um, that was an interesting discussion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Brother Kareem didn't have uh, more than 45 minutes to talk um, but inshallah we'll have other opportunities to speak with him I definitely want to want to get deeper onto this um, suicide issue um, because even if we want to say that from the perspective of individuals or the um, 
the secular sciences, there's no stigma with suicide. It's something statistical. Um, yeah, that is their lens. Okay, there's a lens, but then there's reality, right? Um, and we ha always have to be careful not to fall into a perspectivalism. And this is something that I teach uh, in my classes uh, and I write about often is that uh, within postmodernity, there is this sense or this idea that everyone has their own view. Oh, you have a view, you have a view, you have a perspective, you have your truth, I have my truth. Um, so this is a kind of relativism uh, that is very common intellectually. It's not coherent intellectually, even from a, a secular standpoint. But certainly as Muslims, we don't accept this. We don't accept that, yes, it's true. People have their perspectives and their views, but that does not uh, take anything away from the fact that there is also the truth and objective reality. Um, it doesn't matter if someone thinks uh, that uh, there is no God and that we are just the sum total of random molecular interactions from the Big Bang and we're nothing more than material, physical objects. It doesn't matter if someone thinks that, that's fine. They do think that, many people think that. But is that reality? No, that's not reality. That's not the truth. And so I can't say that you have your truth and I have mine. No, the truth is singular. And so this is something that we always have to remember and we have to be careful not to fall into this kind of uh, perspectivalism, relativism, uh, postmodernism uh, because of this kind of uh, problem. Um, I want to give a shout out here to the super chat contributor. I love one love and charity who has contributed two dollars. And says salams ummah, so wa alaikum salam uh, on YouTube. Appreciate the contribution uh, to the super chat. Okay, so I want to talk about a few things uh, today, inshallah, for hopefully maybe another hour or so. Um, there are a lot of issues that have come up. I haven't been very active on social media over the past couple of weeks. It's been a combination of busyness with uh, Alesna, with uh, you know my online institute. I've been developing a lot of new material, new courses that are going to be up, uh, inshallah, for enrolled students um, at alesna.org. Um, but then also I've been busy with uh, traveling and different kinds of projects that I have. So I haven't really been active with MuslimSkeptic.com. Um, haven't really had anything new. I'm expecting uh, within this week and then hopefully within next week, a lot more regularly I'll be posting material, inshallah, and writing and contributing uh, to that. So, um, yeah, I apologize for the lack of uh, new uh, material on the website, but inshallah that is going to be forthcoming. Okay, so um, let me shift gears now to some issues uh, that I think are worth discussing. Uh, one issue is the um, Sri Lanka bombing. Sri Lanka bombing. So this is something that happened over the weekend. Uh, very sad that people were killed. Um, who is behind this? What, you know, led them to commit this kind of terrorist act? Uh, these are all questions that remain unanswered. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, of course, immediately there are narratives that are published and distributed hours after uh, an event like this, a casualty terrorist event like this happens, um, there's a narrative that is broadcast. And I always am suspicious of this, as I've expressed many times uh, on my website and elsewhere, is that, well, how are all the details suddenly available? Um, and it hasn't even been hours after the event has happened. Um, so this is often questionable. And w if you recall um, last month uh, when the uh, Christchurch shooting happened, the um, Muslim Muslims were killed in New Zealand. 
there are many questions, there are many issues that were left unaddressed. And the initial reports that came out turned out to conflict with later reports. And there were just a lot of question marks. And there was just a narrative that was immediately broadcast throughout the world. Uh, everyone had their candlelight vigils. Everyone had their different kinds of expressions of grief or mourning, solidarity. But a lot of things le were left unaddressed. Um, and, and I brought these up in a previous broadcast. I addressed things like, well, why is this shooter, Brandon Tarrant, uh, who was the, um, you know, the, the shooter and portrayed as the main and only shooter of the, uh, in Christchurch, um, where did he get his training? Where did he get all these weapons? Why is he traveling uh, throughout the world and visiting countries like uh, North Korea, like Pakistan, like Israel, um, all of these kind, like Afghanistan? How is he visiting these kinds of countries as a supposed tourist? Uh, and then he has all this uh, training, as is apparent from how he was able to pull off um, an operation, as he's alleged to have pulled off with killing Muslims. So these are questions that were not really addressed. And the mainstream narrative tends to bowl it over and kind of not really delve into it or ask it. Um, and, and why is that? Why is that? So as Muslims, we have to always be willing to question. We have to always be willing to uh, use our common sense. Okay, use our aql. If something doesn't add up, there's usually a reason for it. And especially when it's so much at stake with the mainstream media, with these different governments um, who are putting out a certain narrative, there is a lot at stake. Okay, and if we have learned anything in our lives uh, in the modern period is that mainstream media often is not truthful. Uh, often they omit, often they abridge, and sometimes they just outright lie. Uh, so this is something that as Muslims we have to understand and recognize. And so when we hear something uh, on the news, we question it. We want to know, okay, what is going on uh, in uh, in reality, not just what is on my screen that I'm being fed, force fed, right? So asking questions is important. So one of the things that with the Sri Lanka um, bombing, uh, targeting Christians and also some tourist sites, uh, there was an interesting status that was updated and, and shared publicly by a Muslim academic that I think is worth uh, looking at. So this is from Ibrahim Musa. He is a Muslim academic. Uh, and, you know, I don't follow everything that he puts out. Um, so I'm not endorsing everything that he might be involved with or his views. But I thought this particular public status was quite interesting. So if, he says, if you're up past midnight Eastern time tonight, there's a good likelihood that an interview I gave to ABC's Nightline program uh, might be aired at 1230 Eastern time about the carnage in Sri Lanka. Come to think of it, this is quite an extraordinary carnage of 290 people and counting. Often similar high casualties of deaths in Afghanistan or parts of Asia and Africa get some reporting, but no follow up. I am scratching my head to think that just more than a month ago, Muslim worshippers were gunned down in Christchurch, New Zealand by the hate of a white supremacist and the world sympathized with Muslims around the world. Tonight, two days after the Sri Lanka carnage, the fingers point to Muslim actors as the terrorists. Am I missing something? Think of this, a few years ago, in a global event of mourning, the world said goodbye to the most visible Muslim sportsman, Muhammad Ali, in June 2016. CNN and all te US television stations taught the world that a Muslim funeral service is called a janaza. It became part of a household vocabulary, at least for a few days. Islam and Muslims, I thought, felt so much part of the complex and paradoxical tapestry of American life. Then, two days later, after Muhammad Ali's funeral, Omar Mateen uh, killed dozens of people in an Orlando nightclub. How can fate turn out to be such a conspiracy? 
I am now sufficiently suspicious of a range of intelligence agencies infiltrating these terrorist organizations to secure counterintelligence information. Otherwise, how did the Sri Lankans get the intelligence several days prior about the impending attacks and fail to take precautions? Could these counterintelligence operations be false flags or black operations? A black operation or black op is a covert or clandestine operation by a government agency. It involves a significant degree of deception to conceal who's behind it or to make it appear that some other entity is responsible. What is also called a fl false flag operation. I do not know, but we need to be extra circumspect as to how these nobody groups like National Tawhid Jamaat in Sri Lanka, uh, who are the alleged um, the alleged group behind the attacks, how they can pull off such spectacular operations. Sure, they can team up with groups like ISIS who are seasoned killers, but this story needs a more complex analysis and I've already strayed into a territory beyond my pay grade. Okay, so this is a very uh, interesting status um, and thoughts, reflections from Ibrahim Musa. And I think it's uh, very noteworthy. I think it's very noteworthy what he's saying. He's saying that, look, many of these Muslim groups who are either officially known as terrorist groups or they are just considered, you know, uh, opposed to government forces or have views that are contrary to government interests, uh, and they're associated with Islam or with a particular religion, the government, okay, governmental agencies throughout the world, not just Western governments uh, or in Sri Lanka, all governments have an interest in s surveilling, spying on, planting um, agents in these organizations, right? And so this is called infiltration. Their, their organizations are infiltrated. And this is something that is known. This is not just a conspiracy. This is often reported um, in, uh, you know, in mainstream news, even within American mainstream news. Think about uh, this whole conspiracy about Donald Trump and Russia, right? Donald Trump and Russian interference. The the whole main uh, the whole narrative that turned out to be false, but at least they're willing to acknowledge the possibility that a foreign nation or, or intelligence agency of the Russians could infiltrate uh, the U.S. government at its highest levels, right? This is something that they are, they were not only willing to believe could take place, they actually believed that it did like take place with Donald Trump. So if, if the, if they can accept that entire government up to the level of the president can be infiltrated by agents of, a, of another intelligence agency or another country, then what about these, you know, small groups, rinky dink, you know, uh, whatever in, in any other country? Of course, these groups are infiltrated. Of course, there's covert agents um, who are within these groups and are feeding information back to the agencies that are controlling them. So this is something that is documented. Um, one of the things that really is interesting, if you want to go look it up, is that the FBI infiltrated a, um, a Muslim group that was planning to uh, bomb the World Trade Center in 1993, the World Trade Center in New York, the same World Trade Center that was brought down 9-11. But in 1993, there was a uh, terrorist bombing um, that the FBI actually helped uh, carry out. Okay, And this is documented. It was reported on American mainstream news. And if you go on YouTube right now, you can see Dan Rather, uh, who is a very uh, famous news broadcaster, talking about the details of this case. Because what happened was w the informant the agent who had a Muslim name and was in this group and who had contact with the FBI, he recorded a conversation between himself and the, his FBI handler. And the FBI handler was telling him, basically giving him instructions, you know, encourage them to conduct this bombing, you know, give them these explosives, 
give them this these instructions basically giving them all the instructions and details and the information to the informant and the informant is who is part of the group okay or is seemingly part of the group has infiltrated the group goes and gives the details and tries to influence the group to actually carry out the bombing to actually carry out the terrorist action and so the, the, these idiots right these muslims who are either mentally ill or they're suffering from any number of problems where they don't recognize they're being duped uh, to commit these kinds of stupid uh, and criminal act acts, um, they actually went and, and placed the bomb and it exploded. And this was the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Uh, so the, that link to the FBI and the FBI actually providing the material for the bomb, providing the directions, providing the idea, this is something that is known, it's reported on. Um, even Rolling Stone had a major article. Um, I, I think it's about six years old now, the article, but it was about FBI entrapment. Entrapment, how the FBI will go to certain Muslims who are either mentally challenged or they're very poor and they're in need of any kind of money just to make rent and just to eat, or they have a criminal record, basically vulnerable Muslims. And posing as Muslims themselves, right? The informant will pose as a Muslim and say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we did, you know, if, if we fought back against this American government? Wouldn't it be great if we, you know, conducted something, some act that would send a message that Muslims will not be oppressed? And so the informant will feed these kinds of ideas to the this vulnerable Muslim or group of Muslims to encourage them to get to them to accept, yeah, let's do it. And once they accept on, on record that, okay, we want to commit this act, then the FBI will swoop in and will detain them, will invite media. The FBI stops another terrorist plot. Another homegrown terrorist is locked up behind bars and they make an, a huge media spectacle about it. And who suffers from that? Well, obviously the Muslim community suffers because now we're seen as terrorists. We're seen as irrational uh, perpetrators of all kinds of heinous crimes and violence uh, against people. Uh, so this is something that really was taking off during the Obama era. There were some certain entrapment plots in the Bush era, but in the Obama era, the most uh, cases of entrapment happened in the Obama era and it was the Obama administration that authorized the FBI to uh, conduct these kinds of entrapment plots and target the Muslim community to surveil the Muslim community to infiltrate the Muslim community this happened this is all a record you can go to rollingstone.com you can go to the intercept you can go to the New York Times these were all th these things were covered in depth there were documentaries made, TED Talks made about how uh, Muslims were being used in this way by Obama. And the Obama administration justified this. Okay, Eric Holder, the attorney general of Obama, said that, yeah, we, we're perfectly on board with the FBI doing this. It's perfectly legal and we think that it's necessary. Um, so people who, Muslims who want to talk about, oh, the Obama, like, oh, it, we're... Let's reminisce about the wonderful days of Obama. Now we're stuck with Donald Trump, but wasn't it so much better when we had Barack, Barack Hussein? He was our man, right? Hope and change. Yeah, when I remember Barack Obama, these are the things that I remember. Okay, I remember how I felt uh, in, as a Muslim in America at that time when these kinds of things were on the news. Oh, another uh, Muslim plot, another Muslim plot to commit terrorism. And the reality was that it was Obama's administration behind the scenes puppeteering all of this, all of these kinds of um, cases that came up and were promoted on the news. And now when I go uh, with my Muslim wife uh, to the grocery store or we go to the park, we're getting these kinds of glares or this kind of negative attention because they watch the news too and they see that, oh wow, there was another homegrown uh, terror plot what are these two Muslims plotting in my neighborhood, in my community? Yeah, that was Muslim life under the Obama administration, right? So wake up, people. Wake up. Um, so yeah, so this, it's, 
I mean, I'm not saying for sure that this is what happened, but it's beyond credi credibility, beyond credulity. And, and Ibrahim Musa here has picked, it, picked up on it. He's asking these questions and hopefully he won't take down this status. But he's saying, how could the intelligence agencies of Sri Lanka, of India, of Pakistan within the subcontinent generally not be aware of this huge plot, right? To coordinated plot to blow up churches and these kinds of major hotels. How could they not be aware of that? How could their informants not have told them about this? And why, you know, and, and it doesn't even make sense. There were other Sri Lankans who were saying, non-Muslim Sri Lankans saying that we have high doubts. We, we really doubt what this uh, media narrative is. Why would Muslims, they're a minority, they're the oppressed minority within Sri Lanka. There's a Buddhist majority and Christians are even a smaller minority, smaller than the Muslim community in Sri Lanka. Why would why would Muslims target Christians? What what sense does that make if even if like let's just play devil's advocate and say that this is a kind of legitimate thing to do to commit this heinous act of terrorism? Even if it were, what what political sense does it make to target this group as opposed to another group? It seems like one could say that it this is not what happened. This is actually nonsense that no one would be so stupid uh, and bring such negative scrutiny, right, to themselves by this kind of uh, bombing of the weaker Christian minority within that country. So Sri Lankans themselves, non-Muslim Sri Lankans themselves are scratching their heads and asking like something's not adding up here. Something's not adding up. And then there are also reports that Muslims were saying that we reported this group. We reported Tawheed Jamaat. We reported them as having these kinds of uh, criminal aspirations. What happened to the report? What happened to follow-up? Okay. What happened to the credible threat? So this is something that we have to just not be naive about. We have to not be naive. We have to ask questions because this is if more people ask questions and more people reject a kind of this kind of very unbelievable scenario, then there will be less motivation for different agencies to conduct these kinds of operations, to conduct these kinds of false flags or black ops, as Ibrahim Musa called, put it. Um, because the whole point of the false flag, the whole point of the uh, black operation is to get the public to react in a certain way, to react in a certain way and to be motivated and mobilized towards a certain direction. And historically, there are so many examples of, um, you know, these kinds of false flags. So one of the big examples that is often noted is that the United States was aware the U.S. government had credible intelligence that the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor and they were actually going to bomb Pearl Harbor. And in advance, the U.S. government knew, but they wanted to avoid evacuation. They wanted to avoid um, actually pulling out their troops from that base. Be why? Because they knew that it would provide a reason. Okay, This would motivate the public the U.S. public to say, OK, we need to go to war. We need to enter World War II. Prior to that, there wasn't much motivation amongst the U.S. public to enter yet another world war. So the U.S. government uh, wanted for their own interest to enter World War II. And this provided a convenient uh, way to mobilize the American public to support the U.S. entering World War II, allow the Japanese to uh, massacre Pearl Harbor in this kind of unprovoked attack, quote unquote unprovoked. And then um, the U.S. public will see that as a huge act of uh, terrorism and will be begging the U.S. government to go to war, to go fight the Japanese and the Nazis and so forth. So the, the use of you know false flags is well known in history. And this is something that I've written about in depth before. Uh, for years, um, and I think it's something that we can't lose sight of. 
uh, when there's events like this in Sri Lanka and even in Christchurch, okay, where Muslims were the victims, Muslims were dying, I was still, I still had the same kind of attitude and the same kind of skepticism. It's a healthy skepticism that we all should have. And then when the public doesn't react, well, this was the point that I was making, when the public doesn't react in that predictable way, then there's less motivation to conduct the false flags because everyone knows it's a hoax. Everyone knows that this is just uh, smoke and mirrors. Real people do die. Yes, real people died, have died in Sri Lanka. Okay, they were murdered. Real people died in Christchurch. The question is, uh, who was behind it? Who was behind it? Who allowed it to happen? Who is behind the scenes? Who is coordinating? Who has the intelligence? Who is sitting on intelligence and not acting? These are the important questions that the thinking Muslim asks. Okay, So much about this dunya is not what it seems. The dunya itself is not what it seems. It seems like the dunya is this permanent abode. It seems like this dunya is solid. Right? Solid and permanent. When the reality is that it's not, it's impermeable, it's, it has no permanence, it will all be destroyed, right? Yom al Qiyamah, all of what we see and what we know of the dunya will be completely annihilated by Allah and then recreated, right? So what we see is often not the case. And also, I mean, this is something indicative that of the, uh, the ulama have, have noted this, that when we look at the signs of the hour, as we approach the day of judgment, the last day, there are certain signs, Ashrat Asa, right, that the Prophet Sallallahu has given us that indicate when the hour is near. And the, the ulama commenting on these have said that one of the characteristics of the later days is that things will not be as they appear. There will be widespread deception There'll be widespread deception. And that's really the nature of the Antichrist, Dajjal, Masih Dajjal, right? Uh, the very notion of the Dajjal is deception. Okay? And, and it's important that we talk about Dajjal. This is something that we need to be talking about. We need to be aware of. The Prophet Wasallam was warning the companions, the Sahaba, about the Dajjal in depth. So how much more necessary is it for us as a community to be aware of the Antichrist, to be uh, vigilant, vigilant, yes, because we know it's going to happen. It's going to happen very soon. So we have to talk about it and we have to go back to authentic sources to understand it. We have to understand the hudud in, in the sense of the boundaries where we don't speculate beyond what is appropriate and there's different adab of course uh, with that but we're not i'm not trying to speculate here i'm just giving a very broad reflection that the very nature of dajjal is deception because he's going to come and claim to be the messiah right he's going to claim to be the messiah at first and that's what's going to fool those who are waiting for the messiah who's waiting for the return of the messiah in the world today. Jews, Christians, and Muslims. We're all waiting for the Messiah. Right? We know who the Messiah is. Isa alayhi And Christians know who it is. They also know that it's Isa. But Jews do not. They, they believe that Isa alayhi uh, was a false Messiah. That's, that was their, their lie amongst many lies against the Anbiya historically. Um, so the Masih hit Dajjal, he's the false Messiah. And so then those who are looking for the Messiah will be fooled. Many of them will be fooled to think that this, the Dajjal is actually the Messiah when he is not. Right? And then the Dajjal will confuse people and show them things that will indicate that he has some kind of miraculous power as if he were really the Messiah, but really he's going to be the Antichrist, calling people to hellfire. So this is why we have to understand uh, who the Dajjal is, what his deception will be. Okay, 
what what kind of things will he be calling to and eventually he's going to call himself god he's going to say that i'm god and and he'll try to uh, show that he controls the weather he controls different aspects of the creation of course it's allah who is giving him that control uh who controls everything but the dajjal is going to claim that he himself is allah and people will believe that because people will believe what they see with their eyes they will believe what they see on their screen they believe it because they saw it and they won't question they won't ask they won't realize that this is all delusion this is all fake fakery so this is the mindset that muslims have to have especially in this day and age especially in this day and age okay let me look at some questions Uh, this is a question about suicide from Sarra. Uh, when it comes to suicide, you mentioned there may be a distinction to be made between someone who commits suicide because of depression, trauma, other mental psychological problems, and committing suicide just because. What I've noticed, though, is that when someone commits suicide, people almost always end up pointing to mental psychological problems anyway i.e., the idea that no one would commit suicide if they haven't reached that level of depression. Sort of another way of saying suicide is always understandable and justified in a way. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly right. Um, this focus on mental health. Okay, do we think that um, Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu are not aware about the conditions that will lead someone to commit suicide? Of course, the Creator knows, but it's still sinful. It's still a major sin. The point is that no matter how difficult life is, Every difficulty that you face in life, from the smallest prick on your finger to entire catastrophe, okay, everything that happens is does not happen except by the will of Allah. Okay? And the whole point of this life is that you have to have sabr. You have to patiently persevere. And this is a means of purification for yourself. It's a means of getting closer to your Lord. It's a way for you to understand the reality of the dunya. Okay? That the pain that we experience in this dunya is not permanent. Just like the dunya itself is not permanent. Okay? So the people, everyone experiences pain. Everyone experiences trial. But Allah promises in the Quran that he will not test a person beyond what he can bear. Isn't that the case? Right? So to com commit suicide because of one's despair, to despair in the mercy of Allah, to despair in the power of Allah, to despair in the qadr of Allah, this, this is our major sins. Okay? It can even extend to kufr. Right? It can even extend beyond just the sin, depending on the person's state. So yeah, this is something that we have to understand. We have to take what Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, we have to take this as reality, because it is reality. And that's the lens, and that's the understanding that we interpret other things, like, okay, trauma, okay, you have a difficult life, okay, you have faced these issues and the, these abuses, all terrible things. And yes, we sympathize, we empathize, we help each other, but we don't help each other at the expense of what Allah has said and what the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have said. There's lines. And I mentioned this last week too, that Muslims just, some Muslims today just mix things up. You know, they mix things up and they go beyond what is allowable in Islam because either they're ignorant of the uh, lines that Allah has set, the hudud, or they are aware of the had, but they just can't help themselves to go over it. They just violate it. They just violate it. Okay, so um, uh, Hassan is saying, where do we watch your videos when you are eventually permanently blocked by Facebook? Uh, yeah, 
Thanks for your optimism. Uh, you can look, you can watch my videos on YouTube. Uh, if that I'm, you know, banned from YouTube as well, then I'll have to find some other solution. But there's MuslimSkeptic.com where I try to keep all my content. Okay, uh, Tarek says, just to challenge you, how can we prove sometimes that something is a false flag? Isn't it difficult? Yeah, of course, it's it's hard to give uh, definitive proof, but that's why I said that we have to ask questions. Sometimes it's enough just to ask questions. You don't have to prove it definitively. Many of the false flags that have, have happened historically have been proven and, and it's documented because the government files have been released, for example, or they've come out in court cases and it's part of the historical record or it's been reported in mainstream news so all the examples i gave are known false flags that's not just speculation it's known and acknowledged within the historical record documented but as far as something that ha is happening in the current time like right now or this year or the past couple of years especially if it involves the west then it's going to be hard to prove but the thing is that you point to questions you point to inconsistencies and that's that's the most that you can do but that's enough because if enough people do that and show that they're not buying it right they're not drinking the kool-aid they're not just thinking with their eyes and believing whatever they see on the news if enough people do that then that's enough to dissuade and to count as a deterrent against those agencies or governments who are behind some of these uh false flags And there's a lot to talk about this, um, but on the issue of false flags, maybe one day we'll have an episode just on the topic of false flags. Uh, but for now, um, you know, that's those are the points that I wanted to make. Uh, here's a comment from uh, Pasho. Pasho. Dajjal is already doing a lot of what Daniel is saying, whether manipulation... Uh, is already happening. The gel system is here. Modern science and technology and surgery make people believe in them as opposed to God. It's interesting. Um, Pasha also says, I find it easy to convince the non-Muslims that Muslims... I find it easier to convince non-Muslims than Muslims on false flag terrorist attacks. Muslims call me a conspiracy theorist while non-Muslims listen to me and I've convinced them. Yeah, I mean, it's... I think not good for Muslims, uh, some Muslims, not to uh, recognize this kind of reality, this uh, documented reality, historical reality. Like you have to be very naive. And I've had these kinds of conversations with very intelligent, educated Muslims. And there seems to be like an emotional issue there. Like they don't, I don't know why. There's a, there's a certain cognitive block to prevent them from considering that. Uh, authorities and power many of the authorities into the modern world are not benign and they're not neutral often they're malicious and often they have no concern or they, they have no problem with a hundred people dying 200 people dying a thousand people dying 3,000 people dying for their purposes right for their they consider that a uh, acceptable sacrifice so, for example, a government wants to, um, you know, implement this kind of uh, war on terror, let's just say, purely hypothetical, a war on terror that is going to advance American interests and is going to allow America or whatever country, let's not say America, let's say any country, there's this country that uh, let's say Nigeria, okay, Nigeria wants to create this global war on terror, not because it cares about terrorism, but because it wants to advance Nigerian interests throughout the world. And if Nigeria is able to control more of the world and more of its resources, that will greatly help and benefit Nigerian people, right? This will help Nigeria as a nation. So let's have this is what the government of nigeria thinks let's have some kind of false flag event some kind of bombing some kind of thing that has 200 of our own people 200 nigerians who die 
500 Nigerians who die. It has to be something major, a mass casualty event. And then when those people, our people, die, then the rest of the Nigerian public will support us in our global war on this global project to influence the entire world. Then when we have that public support that we wouldn't have otherwise, then Nigerians will benefit. Nigerian as, Nigeria as a country will benefit. So there's no problem uh, with sacrificing 100 people, 200 people, 500 people. That in fact is a calculated um, cost that we will make, but the benefit will p potentially save thousands of lives. Thousands of Nigerians could live better and so forth and so on. So you can justify it. It can be justifiable. I'm saying I'm not saying it is justifiable, but you can see how a government could go down this path, uh, this satanic path, to consider sacrificing their own population in a kind of false flag operation for the benefit of uh, for the benefit of national interests. Okay. So this is my thoughts on Sri Lanka. Now let's switch gears to uh, something else that caught my attention recently. Um, so have you heard of this new show uh, called Rami? Rami? Is it Rami or Remy? Remy. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but there's been a lot of news in different liberal outlets about this new show about a Muslim millennial who is going through growing pains and realizing how difficult life is as a Muslim within uh, Western society, American society. And so you have drugs, you have girlfriends, you have all kinds of typical millennial, what we're told typical millennial behavior. And it's a Muslim, it's a Muslim as the main character named Rami. And he's going to be our protagonist who goes through these conflicts and the drama of being a millennial in the modern world and also trying to stick to and hold on to your religion. Okay, so this is a new show that has recently been released. And so it's drawn some uh, mixed reactions, mixed reactions. Here's one reaction that I want to share with you. Uh, this is from Facebook by a brother who made a public post where he reviews Rami. Okay, this is Al Humam, Al Humam Al Samarai, and he says zero out of ten, zero out of ten stars, absolute garbage. They normalize zina like it's not even funny. Yeah, I get it. It's hard to be a single Muslim, but the protagonist literally skipped Tarawih to sleep with a married woman. What the heck is that? They normalize porn and drugs and the nudity is off the charts. Like seriously, even American shows don't have that much nudity. It was disgusting. Rami needs to uh, needs his butt whooped. Nudity and awful sex and unlawful sexual interactions don't magically become okay because you're an actor. Uh, and then this is some kind of Amiya that I don't recognize. <laughs> yeah, Adebziz? Yeah, Terbiaziz? Does anyone know what that is uh, <laughs> referring to? I think it means like someone without Tarbiya or Adab. Uh, so then he says, if you're considering watching this BS show, here's my advice. Don't. You're literally better off watching Game of Thrones than this, uh, you know, Zift, Zift show. My expectations were so high for this. Y'all could have done so much good with this, but no, y'all want to be like Kofar so bad. Pathetic hayawanet animals. You don't realize all the damage this stupid show will do to the Muslim community. Every single one of you godless heathens will be held responsible for all of the Muslim youth. You misguide through this disgusting show. And for what? What did you gain from this? Ya ulad as donkey. Uh, oh, children of uh, sitin donkeys. Uh, 
<laughs> 60 donkeys. I expected so much from Rami. I really did. Didn't think he was such a fasiq and fajr. Itfu. Itfu alaykum uh, jami'an. So this is uh, what this one reviewer says. A very strong reaction. But I mean, this is very serious. This is a very serious issue that a, a show like this is being widely promoted. And why is it being promoted? Is it what is the positive message that is being given in this show that Muslims should support? Honestly, there is no positive message. Okay? It's showing that Muslims are just as filthy. Muslims are just as disgusting and depraved and hedonistic and ungodly as everyone else in society. Okay. So this is not a good message. This is not something that is going to benefit the community. It's not going to benefit uh, non-Muslims. Okay, why would it benefit non-Muslims to to see that Muslims are just like everyone else? They're not going to see Islam as guidance. They're not going to see Islam as something unique that is offering them the truth uh, and moral rectitude. So it's not benefiting non-Muslims, and it's not benefiting Muslims. Because Muslims are going to feel like, oh wow, so this is normal behavior. Everyone else is doing it. Why shouldn't I? This is popular behavior. If everyone is doing it, then I'm going to feel less of a hesitation to engage in these kinds of behaviors. I'm going to have less hesitation to have sex with this random Muslim girl that I met, you know, in Islamic school. Because look, there are these TV shows that are uh, broadcasting it that Muslims are doing this so I don't want to be different and why should you know this is what I want to do anyway I want to fit in I want to be a part of the wider culture my non-Muslim friends and classmates are engaged in this behavior I've been holding myself back because I thought that Islam is different and being a Muslim means I have to be committed to avoiding these behaviors and to avoiding these kinds of sins that's why I thought that's why my parents have been telling me that's what the Imam at the Masjid has been telling me but then I show there's this TV show that is being promoted uh, by Muslims and non-Muslims alike that is saying that oh well Muslims engage in this behavior and you know you can be have some internal conflict about it but at the end of the day look this is life this is what being a Muslim millennial means so there's no problem so this is this is uh, the issue with a show like this and and really it is garbage um and it's going to have you know if you know things proceed in the way that it seems like with different outlets promoting it it's going to have a negative effect uh on the youth and and we pray that allah protects our youth from this protects us from this kind of filth right there's a difference right so i'm not trying to promote so game of thrones here is what this uh, brother mentioned and and I think this is an important point that he makes this is an important point that he makes he says you're literally better off watching games Game of Thrones okay I haven't watched Game of Thrones okay? I don't know what it's about but I know that has a lot of nudity and has a lot of uh, inappropriate material okay but he's saying you're literally better off watching it that I don't think he's promoting Game of Thrones but I think there's an interesting idea here that Game of Thrones doesn't involve Muslims, right? Game of Thrones has no Muslims on it, from what I understand. I don't think, if there were Muslims on it, I'm sure social media, you'd see Muslims praising it even more than some Muslims already do. But the, the difference is that Game of Thrones or another type of show like that that doesn't involve Muslims, the Muslim, even the Muslim who makes the mistake of watching it, still will have that kind of distinction and barrier in mind that, okay, these are what non-Muslims are doing. Muslims are different. Muslims don't engage in this kind of behavior, right? And if they do, they don't advertise it. They don't do it openly. They don't make a TV show about it, right? They don't display it for everyone to see. There's a reason why Allah says that he will forgive sins Except when the sin is broadcast, right? When the sin, when you openly say that, oh, I committed this sin last night. Okay? You did the sin last night and Allah covered you and uh, shielded you so that others were not aware of your sin. But then you yourself in the morning, in the daytime, go and tell everyone, oh, I committed this sin. 
Okay? So you didn't appreciate the uh, ni'mah of Allah, the benefit that Allah gave you of hiding it for you and shielding it for you so that others weren't aware of your sin. But then you throw that away, that ni'mah away, and then you, you do that yourself. You broadcast it. You talk about it openly and sometimes even boast about it. Okay, so this is something that there's a wisdom why. There are many wisdoms why this is not acceptable and why this is so discouraged in Islam. Because once you start talking about it, then it becomes normalized. It becomes acceptable. People hear about it. And when they hear about it, they start thinking about it. They start imagining it. They start, and that's the first step, right? Or they start desiring it themselves. They start desiring it themselves. And then once that desire enters the heart, that's just the first step. Once you desire that first spark, then there are thoughts, then there are intentions, and then there are actions, and then there are actual sins, right? So cut it off, cut it off at the root. Don't broadcast. Don't talk about the sins that you commit. Make toba. Okay. At the very least, keep it private. At the very least, keep it private. And this is how you preserve the moral character of society. So you're literally better off watching something else that doesn't involve Muslims. But then, unfortunately, we have Muslims who are going to praise this show, have already started praising this show. Okay, Rami. And saying, this is amazing, and finally we have Mus uh, uh, Muslim uh, protagonists on mainstream TV or whatever. Oh, this is going to help so much with public relations. And now Muslims are finally going to be relatable. Why do we want to be relatable? I'm perfectly relatable. And I don't have to promote or be a part of this garbage. I'm perfectly relatable with my people, non-Muslims around me, with my neighbors. Perfectly relatable. I talk to my neighbors all the time. They don't need to think that I am, you know, doing drugs and watching porn and having sex uh, with strangers to relate to me. Why don't we try to relate to people by talking about shared values? Why don't we talk to people on the basis of aspirations? What do we aspire to? What do we care about? Everyone cares about the truth. Everyone cares about the truth. Everyone cares about knowing where they came from, where they're going, what is the nature of reality. Everyone cares about this. Why don't we relate to people on that basis by talking about these issues? By explaining to them, this is what the truth is. Please, would you like to talk about this? And yeah, I understand that you don't always have an organic opportunity to get into these deep issues right off the bat, but you work towards it. Step by step, you work towards it. You relate to people. You, talk, you share with them. Okay? You share with them different things. Food. Okay? You help them if they need help. Okay, you talk to them. You be a human being. Okay? And how is a human being defined? It's not a secular humanist definition of what is a human being. What humanism portrays as being human is not human at all. Okay? What Humanism is an alien notion, like a, a robot deviant. Okay? That's what humanism portrays as what a human being is. Okay? Real humanity, what a real definition of a human being is, is found and is only found in Islam. So you want to be a humanist, you want to know what being a human being means, you have to ask and you have to uh, refer back to what the creator of human beings has defined as what a human being is. Right? So... Yeah, even this kind of this garbage show, uh, it makes us more relatable. No, arguably it doesn't. Even on that basic level, it doesn't accomplish it. Okay, so who else, who is promoting this uh, this nonsense of this show? 
Uh, here is CARE Chicago. CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations, is uh, promoting this show. Very unfortunate for CARE to put this out. And I mean, not all the different care regional regions are the same, but Care Chicago is here. And then again, this is a public post. And then what what do we see in the comment section? Okay, uh, this brother Masoud uh, Wahedi, uh, Wahedi maybe. This show does nothing but mock Islam and promote the worst fahisha and yet you are supporting it question mark oh okay, it's a question mark he's not accusing them of supporting it he's like are you supporting it okay that's a legitimate question you're posting about it are you supporting it so then what does care Chicago say I mean this was a perfect opportunity for them to clarify and say that no, we don't support it, but this is just some news. You know, they could clarify. But no, Care Chicago, whoever is running their social media, says, if it's unclear, let us elaborate. We are not a religious council organization. We're a civil rights organization. If you're looking for a place to discuss Fahisha, we kindly advise you look elsewhere. So this is their flippant, uh, disrespectful um, response. Like very shocking, embarrassing response uh, to say this. We are not a religious council organization. Who says that you're a religious council organization? That's not what anyone claimed. Even if it was just an individual, right? An individual person, not an organization who is promoting Rami, this show can ask, well, why are you promoting it? What, what, how are you justified promoting Fahisha? How are you justified in promoting filth that is going to denigrate Muslims? So this is a complete non sequitur, red herring response. And I mean, someone else pointed this out as well. Your care, Islamic, is in your name. Islam is in your name. So maybe you need to rebrand yourselves. Maybe care is obsolete. That the, the name of your organization is obsolete. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, quite an embarrassment. Uh, and then uh, Masoud replies and he says, I kindly advise you to wake up and stop promoting trash that you think promotes Muslim values. Good response. I got it, you're a civil rights organization promoting Fahisha. Okay. And then again, uh, CARE Chicago has this kind of very flippant response with Snow White, it's a, it's a gif. Um, this is this is what our uh, you know the organization who is defending Muslim civil rights in the U.S. They respond with cartoons, like just very dismissive. How is this? How is this even professional? So this is quite shocking. Uh, very shocking behavior. I don't know who is running the social media of uh of care chicago but whoever it is needs to be replaced very fast um and i think the organization itself should put out a statement clarifying to the muslim community what they mean by this that we're not a religious council organization we're a civil rights organization so that means that you can promote and align with anything that you want regardless of what islam says if that's the case, then take Islam out of your name, okay? Take Islam out of the name. If, you, if nothing that, if your values 
and your political positions and your alliances have nothing to do with Islam, please do us all a favor and take Islam out of the name. Don't call yourself Islamic. Okay? That I think that will solve a lot of confusions. Do you know how many uh, how many Fridays okay, growing up, how many khutbas I've heard from care representatives fundraising? And you know, usually it's a good khutbah. Do you know how many uh, uncles, mashallah, have spent so much time and so much effort with care? And all the amazing work that CARE has done defending Muslims back in the day, and maybe to an extent today as well, I would say today as well. And I, I do think that CARE does good work today in defending Muslims who are you know, facing discrimination by uh, different agencies, by different individuals. Yeah, CARE is doing that work and others are as well. So that, that's appreciated for sure and Muslims should appreciate that. But in the past, you didn't have these uh, cartoons and Snow White. You didn't have this kind of uh, promotion of Zina. They weren't out there promoting these kinds of disgusting TV shows. They weren't out there putting out this garbage. Okay? There was another example recently uh, that I um, reported on, on MuslimSkeptic.com. Where Care San Diego saying Mabruk and congratulations to Rami Malik, the son of Egyptian Coptic Christian immigrants. They're congratulating him for winning the Oscar for a movie that he did. In this movie, he plays a homosexual singer. Right? So, what does this have to do with American Islamic relations? He's not even Muslim. Okay. Just because he's from Egypt doesn't make him relevant to Muslims or American Islamic relations. He's Christian. And the role, he, he won an Oscar for playing a homosexual. An openly flamboyant homosexual. So what is the, the business of care that is taking a lot of donations from the Muslim community and, and uh, fundra- does all kinds of fundraisers? In the Muslim community at Masajid, what business is, is it of care to have this kind of congratulations? Right? Or what business uh, is it of care to promote this TV show, Rami? Why? Why is that justified? And are they not aware of the damage that they're doing to the Muslim community? Okay. And now, like, their excuse is we're not a religious council organization is foolish this is a foolish response you can't say that you're not a religious council organization when probably last week there were many care representatives giving the khutbah at different masajid and promoting care fundraising for care so this is this is nonsense Let me see. What is... Yeah, if you haven't noticed, I'm still uh, fumbling with the comments. But hopefully I'm getting better. Let's see what anyone's saying on Facebook. Okay, uh, Brother Tariq is saying, yes, my uncle is best friends with Rami and we've known him for years. Okay, I don't know if that was a follow-up to another comment, but the app does not let me see all the comments. <laughs> Facebook is the worst. Facebook is really bad. Um, yeah, so if you know him, if you have personal contact with him, tell him he needs to really think about what he's doing to his soul. He needs to really think about what he's doing to his akhirah by 
participating in this kind of uh, Hollywood production. You know, I was just speaking a couple of weeks ago to a brother, a beautiful brother, mashallah, who is an actor and he is uh, performing in different kinds of theatrical productions. And he was telling me that he's had many opportunities to actually be featured on mainstream productions, commercials and TV shows. But he's always declined. He's always declined. Why? Because it seems like they target Muslims specifically for the most depraved kinds of roles. Okay? If they're going to have a Muslim be on the program, on the TV show or in the commercial, then they had better have like a beer can in their hand. They better have like a pork chop on their plate eating it. They better like be in a sex scene or be in some kind of gay sex scene uh, on the, in the movie or in the TV show. It seems like that's the requirement, uh, the unwritten rule for having Muslims on your TV program or your movie. And from what this brother was saying, mashallah, I mean, his insight was very profound. He was saying, this is the ticket, right? If you want to be famous, if you want to be rich, famous as a Muslim in Western media, you have to sell your soul. You have to agree to do these things because that's what they're going to make you do. They're going to make you jump through that hoop. Otherwise, they don't want anything to do with Muslims. Okay? They're not going to promote Muslims. They're not going to put a good Muslim, pious Muslim, mutadayin Muslim on the big screen. They're not going to do that. That goes contrary to their entire system. Okay? That jeopardizes and threatens their entire system. For people to see the truth manifested in the behavior and the ethics and the, uh, the actions of a Muslim. They have to prevent people from having exposure to that. Okay? They have to prevent. They have to make people think that there is no other way. That what the modern West provides, uh, the secular, liberal, feminist West provides, that is the only way. There is nothing better. There is nothing better in the world today or in the past than what exists now and what we're showing you on the big screen or the small screen. There's nothing better. So don't bother looking. They have to indoctrinate people like this. They have to condition them like this. If you start showing Muslims, if you start talking about the Quran, if you start showing how Muslims conduct themselves, showing real Muslims, then that destroys the illusion. Okay? Then the whole facade comes down. So they can't do that. The only way, way that they can have a Muslim be on the big screen is one who is fornicating, drinking, uh, is, is gay, actively gay, right? That's the, only, that's the only way. So unfortunately, if you do know uh, Rami, then please pass on that message. Okay, Tarek adds another comment. I was able to see an episode of Rami a while back, and interestingly, while it had flaws, it wasn't nearly as atrocious as the officially released episodes now. Interesting to consider if Hulu got involved and wanted to make it more modern and pushed Rami to add more haram aspects to it. Yeah, I mean, that's very interesting. You get... It's a bait and switch. You get the Muslim community to be excited about, oh, this is a show showing a Muslim millennial and he's living life and he's going through these struggles and this drama. Uh, you get the Muslim community on board and then you prevent them from seeing the more overt haram aspects of it. And then, you know, that's what actually gets released. Yeah, so this is very unfortunate and we have to, just like this brother Masood was doing, ask questions. So if you see someone promoting uh, Rami, it wasn't just care. There was also, I believe, MPAC, 
the Muslim uh, Public Affairs Council. Um, they were also heavily promoting it or different members of MPAC were promoting it. I mean, it's no surprise that MPAC would provo- promote it. They're promoting uh, uh, cross-dressers, transvestites. They're promoting that. Uh, so, I mean, this is not would be like a walk in the park for them to promote this show like this. So we have to be really critical because if you're an organization that's taking money from the Muslim community and you're portraying yourself as a religiously legitimate organization that can come to the masjid and claim, oh, we're here to defend Muslims, uh, then you ha- you have to be accountable. You have to be transparent. Okay. And you can't say, oh, well, this is just social media. We just put out things for social media. And that's not what we actually think internally. No, that's not a legitimate excuse. Okay? Your social media is what's projecting to the rest of the world. That's what the Muslim community is com- consuming from you, is what you have on social media. So if you have garbage on your social media, then you're accountable for that. That's why I said CARE needs to make a statement. They need to say that we retract this post and it was a mistake and we apologize we don't endorse rami uh as a show and you know this is has very problematic aspects as far as the muslim community is concerned as far as islam is concerned so we retract that's the kind of response that they should give when something like this is pointed out and then they should really do some soul searching who is running their social media okay so, alhamdulillah, that's uh, most of the stuff that I want to discuss uh, today. Someone asked, um, what are your thoughts on Ertegrul? Uh, so, I haven't watched any of Ertegrul, um, but people say it's a very good show. So, I haven't actually watched it myself, but, um, you know, it seems to be very popular and has some good themes, mashallah. So, um, let's see. Okay. Someone says Aziz Ansari talking about having arguments with his parents about eating pork and drinking alcohol. Yeah, so Aziz Ansari is not even a Muslim. I, I think he's like an openly uh, declared atheist. So, but still, like he's a brown person who is from a Muslim background, so he still has to pay the price if he wants his own show and he wants to be popular and famous and rich. These are the things that he has to do, you have to do to reach that. Okay, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that I wanted to say? Yeah, there's one other issue that is relevant um, about a civil rights organization. I'm trying to think of the best way to put this because I think it's worth uh, thinking about um, this kind of excuse that CARE gave that we're not a religious organization we are a civil rights organization so how do we break that down the thing is that there are many civil rights organizations okay you have the ACLU American Civil Liberties uh, Union I believe ACLU is probably the biggest and many others you know there are many other civil rights organizations that fight on behalf of Muslims they fight on behalf of other groups okay so if care really has nothing specific to do with Islam why should the Muslim community even care about care right if if it's purely a civil rights organization, okay? Then why should we give our money? Sometimes zakat, okay? Sometimes zakat is given to care. Uh, if you're just a, re- a civil rights organization, why should the Muslim community even bother? The thing is that as Muslims, as a Muslim myself, it's very easy for m- me to live in the west it's very easy okay all muslims in the west look i'll make it very easy we can make care we can make care irrelevant in a snap okay 
we can make care completely irrelevant and make care basically not have any work. How do we do that? It's very simple. I'll tell you how. We just need to fully westernize. We need to fully westernize, fully assimilate, start drinking alcohol, start, you know, take off the hijab, start committing zina, fornicate like donkeys, right? Muslims, just do this, right? Start eating pork, start, you know, maybe even go to church, right? Forget about the masjid, just go to church. There are so many established church churches in the West. Just go to church, dress in the appropriate Western fashions. Don't talk about Allah. Don't believe in Allah. Okay. Don't read the Quran. Don't believe in the Quran. Don't praise Islam. Do not send salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Do not even mention Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Do not uh, name your kids Muhammad, Omar. Ali, Khalid, Fatima, Aisha, D name them Michael, Timothy, Richard, Leslie, Kimberly. These are the names that Muslims, stop calling yourself Muslim. Call yourself, you know, I just, I'm not so sure, I'm agnostic. Okay. If we all do this, okay, let's all do this, we don't need care. We don't need any of these groups because we'll perfectly fit in. There's not going to be any discrimination. There's not going to be any anti-Muslim sentiment. There's not going to be any kind of uh, stereotypes on TV. Okay? And if there are stereotypes, we can laugh and we can joke, oh, look at these backwards cave dwellers, right? These camel jockeys. We can laugh all with everyone else. There won't be a need for care. All we have to do is just abandon our religion entirely, and then we'll fit in. But is this what we want? Are we going to sacrifice our religion, our deen, for the sake of fitting in? For the sake of being uh, not discriminated against? For the sake of living more comfortably? Are we going to make that kind of sacrifice? If we are, then okay, do it. If you're not, if religious principles mean something to you, if being Muslim means that you stand by your values and you practice your values and you have taqwa before Allah and you know that Allah is watching you and you feel accountable to Allah, if that's what you feel, then an organization that's going to represent you had better value that as well. Had better value that as well. And not say, oh, we're not a religious council. We're not a religious council organization. We're civil rights organization. Okay, you don't value Islamic values. You don't care about the Muslim community as Muslims. Muslim doesn't mean you're a part of a particular culture. Muslim doesn't mean a, the color of your skin. Muslim doesn't mean you're a racial minority. Muslims are Muslims by virtue of their beliefs, by virtue of their values, by virtue of their aqidah. That's why we're Muslims. You can't defend Muslims as Muslims and ignore that and ignore the values and the culture. But this is the... Americanization of Islam, American Islam, as they call it. Why? They're making Islam as a ethnicity, as a race. And that's why CARE Chicago will say we're a civil rights organization. What they're trying to defend is our brown people. Not Muslims. Based on their very, what they say. And this is why CARE San Diego... Okay, can praise a Coptic Egyptian Christian for playing a movie role as a homosexual because the actor is from a Muslim background or a Muslim country, I should say. 
So this is completely incoherent. It is completely disappointing, objection, objectionable. We have to hold our Muslim organizations to a higher standard. If they don't want to meet those standards, then we dispose of them. We stop giving them funds. We stop giving them donations. We stop inviting them to the masajid. We stop inviting them to the conventions. We stop going to their conventions. Okay? We stop following them on social media. We don't feed the beast. Don't feed the beast. They're accountable to us. Okay? If they want to be rude like I just showed you, yeah, they need us. We don't need them. And ultimately, need, ultimately we need Allah. We all depend on Allah. You think we're going to be saved and we're going to uh, avoid persecution? We're going to avoid discrimination? We're going to avoid oppression by sacrificing our values? By going against the Sharia? By going against what Allah commands us and what the Prophet ﷺ commands us? You think we're going to be saved and have any success in this dunya by going contrary to the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu No. No. You can have a hundred cares, a hundred organizations like care. Fully funded. You know? A multi-million dollar budget every year. And if we don't obey Allah and we don't obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it won't matter. It won't matter. We're not going to have any tawfiq as a community by turning our backs on uh, Allah and His Messenger. Okay. Barakallahu feekum. Um, next week, inshallah, we will continue Muslim Skeptic Live, episode number 12, I believe. And... Um, as always, uh, you can check out MuslimSkeptic.com for articles and material. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to start being more active and posting on there. And then um, also plug for Alesna, Alesna Institute uh, Online Learning. You can... That um, I say, Jazakallahu Khaira, Jazakum Allahu Khaira to everyone for tuning in, and inshallah, I will see you next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.